Yes, sir. So uh, once again, welcome all participants. And now we'll be having session two by <laughs> Professor Rao. Over to you, sir. OK, and just a second. Thank you, sir. Can you see, see the screen now? Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yes, sir, it is there. Yes, sir, it is there. Ready, OK. Yeah. Oh, so we have uh, uh, in the first lecture this evening, we have looked at um, various aspects about the normal distribution. Uh, we have seen how normal distribution helps us to make some predictions. This is the most common uh, uh, probability distribution in biological world. So you encounter this very often, but not so frequently are the other two probability distributions. One is Poisson distribution and the other one is binomial distribution. There might be many other things, but uh, uh, this is not the uh, occasion to cover them, nor am I an expert in all those things. Basically, uh, in most of my research and anybody's research, these are the three that you encounter. There are special situations you might be using other probability distributions like uh, hypergeometric distribution, etc. Okay. We look at Poisson distribution now. The name comes from um, a guy, Poisson, or just from two, but this distribution, frequency distribution, answers questions about randomness in processes, events, and actions. OK? I'm just giving you idea under what conditions you want to sampling. The most important aspect of sampling from a population is this nagging question is my sample a random sample from the population? Even if you are uh, doing a laboratory research, let us say you have uh, fruit fly culture, so you have enormous numbers there and you have to take a random sample. You collect about say 200, 300 for your experiment. You have to be sure that the sample you collected is random. And how to ensure that it is random? Volumes have been written on random sampling for your typical exercises, for instance, are you working with people? Are you working with tigers? Are you working with uh, fruit flies or beetles? Depending on that, your strategies, your methods might vary as to how to collect a random sample. If I ask you to take a random sample of, uh, say, students uh, from a college, will you be able to go exactly randomly? I doubt. You know why? your own personal biases and prejudices come into the picture. If you are a male student, you might be, um, without your knowledge, without in, being intentional, you might be including more uh, girls in your sample. Things like that, you know, there, there is always a possibility that the sampling is not random, so you must be able to test it in some quantitative fashion if your sampling is random or not. Exit polls, it's the same problem, you know. A lot of people go and take exit polls, especially elections are coming now, all kinds of exit polls. You will see it flashed on the newspaper media, uh, television. Very often you are doubt, did, did they take this random sample, exit polls? Did they go to some selectively, some booths where there is a predominantly one party of uh, people dominating? How could they be so sure? But you know, the importance is unless they take a random sample, their exit poll predictions will not match with the truth when the results come out. So they, they make a fools of themselves. Nobody will trust them. That's why um, there's whole theory of random sampling in statistics. Lentana is a weed uh, and uh, it grows wild everywhere. It's an invasive species. You ask this question, is it randomly distributed or not? Hospital deaths. Many deaths are happening in the hospitals. Are they just happening randomly? Are there some pattern to it? What kind of patterns you might simply say? Well, 
are there some hospitals where adequate care is not given so they are dying in more numbers than in our normal hospitals things like that you know but as but once you have to admit that they are random then if they are not random then only you start questioning if the moth is laying eggs on um, say leaves um, is it uh, laying the eggs randomly or is it some preferentially selecting some leaves will be accidents happen and we now and then you read uh, in the newspapers something derailed something um, hit some uh, cow or something on the tracks there was accidents are they happening randomly are there some months in which the accidents are more frequent than others so you have to show that they are happening randomly one could never predict species are becoming extinct over the geological periods is it happening randomly or were there any geological periods okay in which extinctions were more than in other uh, geological uh, periods like this you know there are so many so as i said that this uh, distribution name comes from uh, poisson um he is a mathematician in fact his passion for maths led him to make this statement life is good only for two things to do mathematics or to teach it any faculty listening to this from mathematics department will be thrilled to uh, see this statement so the uh, formal uh, the formula and all these things are given okay so you can see that it depends on the mean and the frequency okay we are not talking about standard deviation we are talking about only mean now here it's used as lambda but don't get confused it's the same thing as that we have used mu there the mean there are two important properties of poisson distribution the mean of the variable must be small relative to the maximum possible in a sampling unit okay two the occurrence of the event should be independent of prior occurrences within the sampling unit this, this is the one that we hang on to to test our randomness since the poisson distribution one of the properties are uh, important property is this now we simply say ah i can use poisson distribution quantitatively to test if this is random or not my sample my events my processes are they random apply poisson distribution and see if it is so you can see from this we use for events rare and random randomness can occur in space and time in space it could be in one dimension i ask my students can you think of some situation where in one dimension you see normal i mean uh, poisson distribution or random distribution not easy to come up with they think of so many things but i could come up with something like this bird sitting on a telephone wire you can ask if they are just uh, their positions are random or not fetch hmm so that's one example it could be in two dimensions that's easy to think because you can think of a, a track of forest um area and look at the weeds in the uh, grassland are they distributed randomly or in some other fashion a three dimensions can you think of something i came up with this one to tell my students Daphne a butterfly distributed in an aquarium you pour some daphne into them say 200 300 uh, do they distribute themselves in the whole volume of the water randomly you can check so random randomness can occur in space in one dimension two dimensions and three dimensions it will occur in time also frequency of train accidents in india since independence you can check that 
right? That is, did the train accidents occur randomly over the years, or were there some years in which the frequency of railway accidents was much more? Then, of course, you can uh, give a political tint to the test. During that government, there were too many accidents. So you can ask all kinds of questions. And see, there are a variety of situations where you can apply random distribution. You heard of truffles? They are some kind of mushrooms. And they are collected and sent to restaurants. And believe me, I never tasted. Supposed to be one of the, I don't know, delicacy wise word, I don't know, uh, fancy, but most expensive mushrooms you can think of, something like thousand rupees, two thousand rupees kilo, sometimes five thousand rupees. So you can expect to eat something like this only in some five star restaurants if your purse is loaded. Frequency of hurricanes in the USA over the last 100 years. Delhi, Walong, Kelly, this also could be a good, good question to ask. Are they occurring randomly? Uh, there are really peculiar situations where power failures are occurring more in certain, certain weeks, certain months, certain areas, whatever. I just dug up something that uh, uh, was using statistics in literature. You know, uh, as my curiosity, just how is somebody using this, you know? And uh, I ran into this uh, novel by Thomas Pinchong uh, called Gravity's Rainbow. It has been read one of those books, novels where uh, statistical applications were heavily used. In this, the hero. Uh, his name is Roger Mexico, a uh, funny name. Uh, he was asked by uh, the London city government a very important question. During World War II, the German Nazi planes were bomb dropping bombs all over London. Okay? And they do it at night. Yes? Okay. Uh, is there some problem, Tabasam? Can you hear me all? See the screen? Yes, sir. It's perfectly oh, okay. fine. I heard some noise and all that. Okay. So, but the government wanted to know whether these drop, uh, Nazi bombs were being dropped randomly all over London because it's at night. Or do they have some idea about some key military uh, installations where they can do maximum damage and they are dropping only there? So this Roger Mexico goes about collecting the places where uh, these uh, bombs were dropped and maps them and looks at the grid and puts these points and uses poison distribution to see if they are conforming to random distribution or not. Then apparently in the novel, he concludes, sir, don't worry. They don't know any military installations where they are in this darkness. They are just dropping randomly, hoping that they will hit some uh, key installations like that. Okay, That's interesting. So the expected probabilities can be calculated using the sampling, the poison distribution formula I gave you. And this is the formula to use to calculate the expected probability of what? The expected probability of events, no events. The probability that there will be one event. Probability that there will be two events like this. So, if you talk about 100 railway accidents over the last so many years, at least 30% of the cases, that means in 30 years, there'll be, there would have been no accidents at all. 36 years, there was one accident per year, like this. The total acts of course, was 100%. So this immediately gives you an idea, by using this poison distribution, you can calculate whether the observed events and processes and activities 
were random or not. If they are random, they should have been like this. If I looked at the last 100 years railway accidents, at least in 30 years, there should be no accidents at all. Nothing occurred, etc. So um, again, thankfully, um, somebody has prepared Poisson distribution tables, so you don't have to use the formula to calculate the expected frequencies. So you can see that for a mean value, see, for Poisson to read the expected frequencies, you have to need to know only the mean. Okay, but for normal distribution curve to know the expected frequencies, you have to know both mean and standard deviation. So knowing this now, the mean is 0.4, you can see 67% uh, should have no events, 27% should have one and like that. Okay. So that's how Poisson distribution is used. Another important property, the variance and mean are equal in this. Okay. So this ratio of the variance divided by the uh, mu or sample uh, standard deviation squared divided by mean is called coefficient of dispersion. If the coefficient of dispersion values, if it is one, it indicates totally random dispersion. If it is more than one, it indicates clump of dispersion. That means grouping together, they were not randomly distributed. If it's less than one, it's uniform or repulsive distribution. Repulsive, not repulsive. Okay. So this is some quantitative measure of looking at if it is not random, what is it? How do they look? These other two clump are repulsed. That's random. That's uniform, see, all like military um, personnel standing before the drill starts. That's uniform. Now you can ask the question, do we see that kind of uniform dispersion anywhere in the biological world? Well, some plants might be doing that, we don't know. I mean, you can check it out. That means if the value is less than uh, one, the coefficient of dispersion value. So here you can see the clumps, three or four together, three here together, three together, or four together like that. So it must be aggregated or clumped. So these are the three common ones. Let's look at some examples. That is a clump distribution. Okay. Coefficient of dispersion is much more than one. Knowing fully that it's not random anymore, you can ask questions, why are they congregating together? They have some conference going on or uh, they are all just getting together to feel warm in this Antarctic uh, cold climate. We don't know. Huh, this must be familiar to you, especially during the second wave of the pandemic. So what is the dispersion pattern here? Uniform. Everybody is given a place and it just goes. Whether people are obeying this or not, I don't know. And that is a clump distribution. Motion or dispersion more than one. See, so another exercise we could get, uh, colleges, you can get to, everybody knows about hemocytometer. Uh, generally, it's used before all these fancy analytical instruments came, people are using hemocytometer to look at the blood counts. That looks like that. And you can see in the 16 cells, are the um, RBCs randomly distributed or not? Something that can be quickly done. I'm not showing the calculations of uh, finding out whether it's uh, coefficient of dispersion is one or two or whatever. I'm just showing quickly. Another one, um, during pandemic time, we could do or could have done is uh, take a vegetation chart, which is just a, an imitation of how a forest might look with the different species of um, trees, plants. I'll show it by ABCDs here, alphabet. 
and we use a quadrat. In real life, we might make a quadrat of say one meter square and go into the forest and do it. Otherwise, I use a cover slip on this uh, A4 size uh, vegetation chart and do the calculations. Then I can tell you whether it's uh, clumped or random or not. Another exercise I used to do, or uh, this, this year I did, I wanted to test if students or, or anybody is capable of arranging these coins on this um, carrots board so that their positions will be totally random. Okay. It's very easy to do that. You know, so I colored all these things red just to avoid confusion. So all 19 are red. I asked the students to take this um, literally. Um, sorry. Um, their cursor and put it wherever they want to and finally test it whether what they have done is random or not. What they could have done is uh, use a grid after looking at and see how many grids have no uh, coins, how many grids have two coins like this and then do the calculations I have shown you in the previous slide. Then you can see if what they have arranged. Then I asked the students to take a photograph of the uh, positions that they have arranged and send me. You know what? Out of the 20 students, 18, it proved to be non-random. That means uh, you, in a subjective way, if you think you are doing randomly, very rarely you come out random. Only two people probably that two accidentally that proved to be random arrangement of the coins. So this is something that uh, you could do when there is no contact, physical contact in a laboratory is not possible. You can have the students do this kind of a testing. Okay, that's uh, enough of this uh, Poisson distribution. And we'll uh, go through the binomial distribution. Okay. Poisson distribution, uh, as you have seen just now, is very useful when you want to test randomness. That's the most important uh, benefit of knowing uh, Poisson distribution. You can always check if something you did is random or not. Binomial, by the very term, this means it uses a, a dichotomous variable. <clears throat> okay. Dichotomous are two mutually exclusive values, or we call them uh, in statistical parlance failures and successes, such as living dead. Only two possible outcomes. You cannot be half dead. Either you are dead or living, healthy or deceased, male or female. Right? So these are the dichotomous variables. Smoker, non-smoker. COVID positive or COVID negative? You have to be sure, you know, I mean, are you positive or negative? Well, I don't know, it could be positive or negative kind of thing. Why? I mean, either you positive or negative. There is no other way in between. These are dichotomous variables that can test it out with a binomial distribution. Again, curiosity in literature. There's a famous starting sentence of a novel that includes beautifully these dichotomous variables. I don't know how many of you guessed this. The first starting sentence of this novel. Very famous novel, very celebrated first sentence. Okay, I have given you enough time. That is Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, where the novel starts with this sentence. So, see, the dichotomous variables, best, worst, wisdom, foolishness, belief, incredulity, light, darkness, hope, despair. A beautiful sentence. It summarizes the the, the things going on in this Victorian era, when this uh, episode or uh, story was unfolding in two cities, London and Paris. 
both the extremes existed side by side. Anyway, so that's just sort of a, a literary uh, digression. So, um, you might have learned in, uh, you know, this um, binomial theorem in your basic algebra courses. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the exclusively. And these are um, self-explanatory. But some of these things come in handy when you're trying to calculate the probabilities of certain events uh, in a biological situation. Okay, this is another rule. So you multiply the probabilities of both. So that gives you what chances you have of getting uh, this type of combination. I'm giving you a biological example here. A moth occurs either as a white moth or a gray moth in the same habitat. So we ask this question. You look at the probabilities. So, an example. I worked out example quickly to show you how the calculations are done. Probability of a smoker is P, and obviously the rest of the population are 1 minus P, probability. Look at this now. We encounter the first person, say we are interviewing uh, some people to ask, sir, uh, do you smoke? Okay, two persons uh, at random, you caught them, again, random, okay? And you ask, sir, do you smoke? Both said, they are, we both, we are smokers. So the probabilities uh, are multiplied. So that's P square. The probability of the, both the small uh, people, individuals you sample being smokers is P square. The probability that one is a smoker and the second person is not is PQ. But in statistics, the sequence also is important. Was the first person a smoker and the second person non-smoker? Or first person smoke non-smoker with the second one is? So that also is important, the sequence in which the event occurred. So this now you can see that it should be PQ times QP, so 2PQ, right? And neither of uh, smokes is since it's uh, Q is non-smokers, 1 minus P or Q is becomes Q square. So this boils down to an equation that must be very familiar to you. P plus Q square is P square plus 2PQ plus Q square. Probability of both being smokers, Probability of both going non-smokers, the probability of one being a smoker and the other being a non-smoker. Okay, this value, that number you put there is called the binomial coefficient. This is uh, just showing, it's quite possible that you know all these. I assume so, because you must have had some algebra. So, if k, k is the uh, number of trials you had, suppose you are looking at four people at a time, that k is four. If you are looking at three mangoes at a time to see if they are interested, that's k is three. So, first you do is simply start with the highest exponent four, and uh, the, the next one q will be zero, and then keep one you decrease, other one you increase. 
P3, uh, Q1, P2, Q2, P1, Q3, P0, Q4. All right. That's how you assign. But now you also know have to know how to assign the coefficients. There you go. Simplified. Now how to add the coefficient. There's a formula. And choose X and you can use this to calculate. That gives you five. For that example, okay. But there is an easier way, which folks like us use. That's called the Pascal's triangle. You start with one, so P Q. When it is K is two, P. Then for the other one, P Q square, P Q right, two P Q, one Q square. Three. P Q. Three. P Q square, three P square Q square, one uh, Q Q like that. Okay, so that's how the co uh, coefficients are added to the equation. When the K is five, the coefficients to add in sequence are one, five, ten, ten, five, one. That's you can check also that is true or not. Now see the equations. If you able to from that uh, Pascal's triangle, you should be able to assign for the last one. That's why I pause and ask my students to fill that. They should do this. See how these things go, exponents come down for P and increase for Q, 5, 4, 3, 2, like this. and then it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Coefficients, 0, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. So, so just let us take a uh, worked out example. Okay, this is something that you could sample. We ask this question. How many samples can you find two left-handed and one right-handed student in your sample? That means each time you take three students randomly. So we put this binomial expansion. So what we want is this for this question. Two students left-handed, one student right-handed. Two, one. This three p square q. You calculate. So, in nineteen percent of the samples, you will get this situation. Okay. Okay, and you do this sixty times randomly, taking three students each time. So, what were you getting? 11 times you will have this combination coming. Okay. That's the idea of binomial distribution. Well, what you have calculated um, the frequency um, expected ones based on only sample that may not apply for the entire uh, population. It's like asking uh, randomly three or four students, uh, sir, uh, in the college, sir who is your best teacher uh, in the entire college for any or not to be, you say X. Is it true for the entire college population that they will agree that it is X is the best teacher? You don't know. So for your uh, estimate, based on your four samples, you said you came with this uh, formula and finally said 20% of the students believe that he is the best, etc. Now, if you build confidence limits for your estimate, then you can make a statement about the population. The same question we posed, can you extrapolate from your sample to the population with some confidence? Statistically, confidence means something which we will explain when we go to hypothesis testing on 17th February. So, right now, you confidently say, although I sampled only uh, 30 students for left-hand, right-hand kind of situation, 
but from the entire college population, I can tell this is going to be the ratio. So from your sample, we are extrapolating with some confidence to the entire college population. So then this is the as an example. That's a formula to use to calculate the confidence intervals and say in which levels, limits it will lie, your estimate. That will apply to the entire population. In the movie, you got 0.2496 and 0.15. What you're saying is this, although I said 20%, let's say 0.2, right? An example, 20% of the students are right-handed, or the other way if you want. 20% of the students are left-handed. That means 80% are right-handed. But in the entire population, probably this estimate lies between 25 and 15. 25% uh, highest, 15%. My estimate lies in between. These are called the confidence limits. So from the pop sample, we got 2.2. Now we are confidently saying in the entire student population, the value or percentage must lie between point, I mean 15% and 25%. That's a statement you can make. What this 95% confidence level is, we will explain that when we talk about the hypothesis testing on uh, 17th. Uh, what I don't know exact date of some occurred in February. Okay. There is what's called also a negative binomial distribution. Again, something said rather rare, uh, but there are situations, of course. And then hypergeometric distribution. Um, I would say that you rarely encounter these things unless your uh, research area is such that uh, the data will fit exactly only with the negative binomial distribution or hypergeometric, then you tend to look up and use your statistical software to easily calculate the expected frequencies. But normally we do not encounter these uh, distribution patterns. We are quite uh, content with most of the time a normal distribution, Poisson distribution, and binomial distribution. So thank you. And uh, oh, yeah, I, there might be some homework problems if you are interested in doing. So we are looking at the probability that a randomly chosen one ML sample will have two paramecia. This means now we are talking about uh, situation where uh, we are testing for randomness. Again, randomness in, in time. Very relevant to our times in which we are living. Testing for positivity of COVID. We can ask these questions. Okay, so I think that's oh uh, that's end of it, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, that finishes. Person? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, if you want to um, start your question answer period, I'm available. Yes, sir. We would like to st uh, start our question answers before that. It was really, uh, thank you so much, sir. It was really an insight into very important and basic concepts of biostatistics and that too in a very simple 
and effective way from examples from our daily life. So all of us, we enjoyed this lecture. And now I would hand over to Dr. Ratnam Vatal for taking the question answers. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Tabasu. And thank you, Professor Rao, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I'll take up the uh, questions and... Uh, uh, a request. Uh, could the one asking the question come on video so we can see some faces? Beg your pardon, sir? Anyone who is asking the question, can they show up on a video here so we can see uh, um, the students at least a few faces? Yeah, sure. In fact, uh, some of them have sent their questions in the chat box, but before that, I was about to ask them that if somebody will like to come on video, so we'll unmute them. You can yeah, raise your hands and yeah. we'll unmute you. That'd be nice, you know. So, yeah, lots of them. Please <laughs> unmute. <laughs> okay, yeah. Dr. Ashish Abhishek Roy. Dr. Abhishek Roy, you can, yeah. Hello, Abhishek. Please unmute, Dr. Roy. Please unmute. Can you hear me, ma'am, uh, sir? Yeah, now, yes. Welcome. Sorry. Yeah. Can you turn on your video, Abhishek? Yeah, it is switched on. OK. Somewhere I should be able uh, to see you. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your uh, brilliant presentation. And we came to know a lot many things about binomial and poison distribution. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so in the first session, you were told about uh, the standard error. So I wanted to ask that, uh, like in that uh, standard error, the value of S, I'm a bit confused about the value of S. Like it could be any value which we can take. Like you talked about Z score, right? And it is also called as standard deviate, right? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, yeah, normal standard deviate is different from standard deviation. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So okay. In that so, standard deviate, uh, the value of S is confusing me. Like it could be any value we can take like for studies. No, that is for your uh, ideal standard normal distribution where mu was zero. Okay. So what we are talking about here for S is the standard deviation you got in your sample. Okay. You calculate all the values and uh, use the formula and come up with the standard deviation. What does the standard deviation tell you? It tells you about the amount of variability in that measurement. Okay. Yes. Okay. Suppose now, to give you an example, you take measurement of heartbeat rate, okay, from students of the same age, same gender, same state of disposition, and all that, everything else being equal, the amount of variation in the heart pulse rate or heart rate will be negligible. So yes, yes value will be small. The yes. importance of this in um, uh, practical studies is the confidence intervals for your estimate, whether you are doing a, a, poll, a poster and give the exit polls estimates for the candidates or for anything, you want to keep the confidence limits as narrow as possible so that people can believe you. Now, see, for example, if you say this candidate uh, can uh, get anywhere between 20% votes to 45% votes, it's ridiculous. You can't believe that. I mean, what kind of polls uh, you're polling, uh, exit polls is this? But if you said, sir, you are likely to get between 30 and 35 percent, that sounds believable. The candidate will say, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm, no, I'm confident that I won't lose my um, deposit. So at least I will win. Right? So in this sense, you try to keep the confidence limits as narrow as possible. Which are two ways things to do. Either make sure the variability S is less because in the numerator or denominator, there is sample size, the N is there. So if you increase the sample size, confidence limits will come down. You can see that? Yes. And so this is one advice statistician give you. Try to take as big a sample as possible. Right? Uh, or try to reduce variability. You, some people ask you, know, sir, how can we reduce variability in the population and your sample? It's like this. 
suppose you are uh, weighing um, a bunch of um, uh, say samples from your uh, cultures and you weigh them all together and uh, come up with some conclusions there are a lot of variability in the weight of this body weight okay then you say why did i get so much variation then you see that your sample was a mixture of both males and females yes, then you say okay i should take the males separately and females separately then s will value come down so yes. there are ways of doing that so that you to start with your samples is as homogeneous as possible so that the standard deviation will be less yes. and then the second piece you try to increase the sample size so that the confidence interval will come down okay that is the rationale thank you sir okay. got it thank you sir okay mm. thank you professor rao Next. anyone else who would like to raise hand and ask a question well but there are nearly 70 students come on uh, ask me challenge me question me <laughs> <laughs> come on till then uh, i'll ask you on their behalf okay. uh, one question is how much area will be covered under four standard deviations you can calculate is from 99.5 99.7 it will go to 99.9988 whatever it is but it will never touch 100% or zero on either side because by the theory the tails of this per curve keep on stretching without touching the basic axis of uh, zero and 100 But then it's theoretical because if you are taking a sample of 100 or 200, okay, how many are left out after three standard deviations on each side? If you take thousand, still only three are left outside your three standard deviations. Big deal, you know. So it's just ignored. Right? Thank you. The second question is: Why are there more frequent left or right skewed data in biological samples like age curve? obviously uh, uh depends on the sample you are collecting if you are taking from heterogeneous population okay um it will include all ages from kids to senior citizens right so they will be a, a more or less normal curve but if you go to a senior citizen home and try to get the curve because there will be lot of skewness because most of them are to the other extreme and so basically your sampling will indicate how much skewness could be there and how much is not how much is natural how much is sampling error okay all right sir thank you next is how can we transform the data that turn into normal distribution well i didn't cover this aspect because again the lecture will be too long basically um a non normal looking data you can normalize them so that they show a kind of a bell shaped curve the frequency distribution by transforming the data in so many ways one is commonly done is change the arithmetic values of your observations to log values either log based on or natural log then then you check again to see if they look more like a normal distribution when you get your values you can take the anti log of that and uh, report the other one is you can take a square root of that you can take a reciprocal of that whichever gives you uh, normal distribution when transformed all right sir so another question is can we prepare the normal distribution curve using ordinal data no no um, but because they see normal distribution uh, sort of assumes that there is any number of intermediate observations okay if you look at say um weights from 99.1 to 99.2 there could be any number that if you were uh, sensitive instruments to measure 99.11 99.12 like this is a continuous distribution but if you look at uh, um a red flower and a yellow flower these are discrete there is nothing in between values that go from a so so red light yellowish red reddish there is no way except you are being subjective so that's why discrete variables cannot show normal distribution oh uh, thank you another question uh, is it possible to get samples 100% randomly 
um, generally not. Okay, but if you are picky that you want to make sure that the sample is random, there are so many ways. For instance, you will simply take a random number table which is available. Okay, the, then uh, suppose you are uh, you see people coming and you want to take a random sample. The random number the table might tell you the number you choose is two. So the second person you come along, you ask the question. The next question, uh, random number says seven. So you wait until another four or go and you take the seventh one. Like this, typically if you use a random number table, you can definitely come up with a random sample. This applies to uh, say a bunch of uh, leaves or something. If you want to take randomly, you give them a set of numbers. Okay. Then use the random number table. Say I want a second leaf, third leaf, 24th leaf, 18th leaf like this. You will get random. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, the last question is, is there any simple example which we can use to explain difference between parameters and statistics to students? Basically, parametric statistics means the distribution patterns of those parameters is explained by two parameters, mu, the mean, and standard deviation. Okay, that's why they are called parametric statistics because they are using these parameters. In non-parametric statistics, these two do not have any relevance because we do not assume that they show normal distribution. Only for normal distribution, these mu and um, sigma are typical. But for non-normal distribution or non-parametric distributions, statistical tests use the simple entire uh, data distribution without asking, are we using the mean and standard deviation like that? No. At the most, some uh, non-parametric statistics will let you use median. Because median is not going to change much, it's the 50 percentile position, regardless, right? So that can be used for non parametric statistics. So that's why I said earlier that in most non parametric statistics and testing procedures in sociology, philosophy, education, linguistics, they tend to use more often the median. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you for asking, uh, sorry, answering the questions. And uh, we come to the end of the program. Uh, I, on behalf of the organizing committee of the workshop and Department of Botany, Zakir Sen, Delhi College, would like to thank our esteemed speaker, Professor Rao, for enlightening us with his knowledge and experience in the field of biostatistics. This workshop is a brainchild of our colleague, Dr. Sabinder. And when we started planning about this workshop, our first thought was of Professor Rao. Professor Rao is a stalwart uh, in the field, sir, and he was kind thought. enough. Sorry, sir. I said you should have been the first thought then. <laughs> no. And he was kind enough to have uh, enlightened us in our initial workshop on biostatistics for teachers way back in 2017 yes. and uh, we are grateful to you sir for having accepted our invitation i really liked your presentation and especially the examples whether it was birds sitting on a line or spoon example or carom or whatnot i mean uh, even from the pandemic thank you once again We'll also I, like to, sorry. Yeah, no, I also wanted to thank you and the, uh, and the hope that the participants of this workshop are gaining some information, something useful from my talks. And that's yes, why I, I would like to um, get the students' feedback at the end of my last lecture also, so that I have some idea whether I have done a good job or not. Uh, but ultimately, the target audience should tell uh, whether the speaker has been good, useless, or what. So we'll share the feedback with you. We are collecting right. feedback. Sure. Sure. I would also like to express my gratitude to the participants for their overwhelming interest in the workshop, and especially on a Sunday evening. Uh, I would yes. 
I'd like to thank the college principal for her support in the conduct of the event. And before we end today's session, I would request all participants to uh, attempt the assignment and the feedback form well in time. It is, uh, as we have mentioned time and again, it is essential prerequisite for getting the certificate. And can I now request everyone to switch on their videos to capture the moment for a group photograph, please? Thank you, Tabassam, for conducting very well the session. Thank you so much, sir. Your, I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture and uh, uh, the concepts are more clear to me, definitely, sir. My pleasure. OK, then. So then shall I take leave? So one minute, okay. we'll take a group photograph. Ah. Thank you so much, sir. OK, thank you once again. Hey, good night and thank you so much. Good night. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you all. For thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye.